Hurricane Matthew slams into Haiti today with wind speeds of up to 145 miles per hour. At least nine people are dead. The output close to 400 million, that would be the impact. San Diego Economist took a look at the impact of the Charger Stadium plan on November's ballot. One of our biggest problems in City Heights is the lack of affordable housing. And what issues matter to you most in this election? Voters weigh in. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A state of emergency in the East Coast this week. Residents are preparing for the worst. As Hurricane Matthew gets closer, experts say the storm may strike Florida's Atlantic coast, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. The last storm to hit that area was Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And several U.S. Navy ships are on standby to be sent to disaster relief missions to Haiti and other Caribbean nations. Hurricane Matthew has now left at least nine people dead in Haiti. U.S. foreign disaster assistance teams were also deployed to Jamaica and the Bahamas just in case assistance is needed there. Here in San Diego, immigrant rights activists are calling on the U.S. government to once again change its policy and let Haitian immigrants cross the Mexico border. In recent months, thousands of Haitians have come into the U.S. They're fleeing economic crisis in Brazil, where many of them had to move after ha Haiti's devastating 2010 earthquakes. Last month, the U.S. essentially closed the door on tens of thousands of more who were on their way, including husbands and sons of those who are already here. KPBS, KPBS's Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. Sandra Alexandra's baby was born about a week ago in San Diego, hours after Alexandra crossed the border. <laughs> just one day, just one night had passed and the baby came. The little girl's name is Nova Victoria, or New Victory, but Alexandra doesn't feel she can quite celebrate. U.S. immigration policy shifted within hours of her crossing. As a result, the baby's father, Volsi, has been stuck in Mexico. He still hasn't met his daughter. It's very difficult for me and for the baby. I don't know when he's going to come here. During the immigration influx, some women and children were given priority to cross. With the policy change, their husbands and sons are stuck in Mexico. Immigrant rights activists say about 50 families have been separated. Alliance San Diego recently started a petition asking the U.S. government to let those families reunite. So we can live together as a family. Alexandra says she wishes she'd known the policy was going to change before making the dangerous trek through Latin America with her fiancé while she was nine months pregnant. Many times, she almost gave up. I was like, it's too difficult. I will make it. But well, she said, yes, you will make it. Little by little, but you're going to make it. Be brave. She says she can't go back to Haiti. In Haiti, life is very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. It's also very dangerous. Just a few days after the baby was born, Volsi turned himself into U.S. immigration authorities. Alexander hopes he'll be released so he can meet his baby girl. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. No on legalizing recreational marijuana. That was the message today from the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. Those in attendance voted unanimously against Prop 64. Marijuana is illegal for a reason, and it should stay that way. Tuesday, county supervisors made their stances known about the proposition to legalize recreational marijuana. That this is bad for San Diego in many, many ways. Members of the public also had a chance to weigh in. Look to Oregon State as a really great example on how they regulated. They took time with their regulations in regards to legalization. They didn't say, great, recreational is legal across the board, just have at it. Our prisons and our jails are filled with people of color who were convicted of 
fairly minor marijuana offenses. In California, we have approximately 300 marijuana-related fatalities every year. If we legalize marijuana, that could jump to 600 every year. That's almost two every single day in our state. At times, speakers drew from personal experiences. Uh, this drug is a gateway drug. Uh, of the friends that I've known, and there's quite a few that have died from drugs, more than half of them started with pot. When I was the CEO of an artillery unit at the rock pile, I had two Marines who smoked pot in a listing post, and the next morning we went out and visited their bodies because their throats were cut by the North Vietnamese. Um, they weren't paying attention. So from that day on, I have been opposed to this. If passed, Prop 64 would establish sales and cultivation taxes. Supporters say this would bring in $1 billion that can fund drug education, prevention and treatment programs aimed at teens. While opponents, including representatives from the sheriff's office and district attorneys, say Prop 64 may make it easier for pot to get in the hands of minors and lead to more people driving under the influence. Four county supervisors agreed. Prop 64 is bad for San Diego. Supervisor Bill Horn says he hopes voters consider this at the ballot box. Tomorrow night, our Cannabis at the Crossroads series heads back to Humboldt County. We'll introduce you to a businessman who wants to transform this area into the Napa Valley of Cannabis. That's tomorrow night right here on KPBS. Another decision to be made by voters in November, whether to use a hotel tax to fund a new downtown stadium for the Chargers. A new economic impact report finds the team's plan will generate a huge economic footprint. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has details. On game day, these incredible views would be shared with our fans. The economic review predicts a major impact if the stadium complex is built. University of San Diego economist Alan Jin says, Building the multi-use facility would generate an economic boost of more than $2 billion. Jin says the facility, once built, will add a yearly economic benefit. The output close to $400 million, that would be the impact, the annual impact on gross regional product. You see that the employment impact, about 6,500 jobs, uh, of which 4,200 are direct. Those numbers include the team's current $100 million economic impact and the more than 1,000 jobs the team already creates. Co-author Murtaza Baksamusa says the majority of the ongoing impact will come from the convention center annex. That's according to the team-backed Hunden Studies economic assumptions. The annex is projected to employ more people than the existing convention center, which is much larger. But Baksamusa says building the facility will create jobs and that impact will last several years. 15,000 workers includes generally two types of workers. The, the white collar workers, which are generally architects, engineers, construction managers. And then there is the blue collar workers, which all the way from the foundation of the building to building it up and finishing it creates jobs all along. The economists say that the Chargers paid them about $18,000 to do the study, but they say there was no influence from the team. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. What's the biggest issue in your community? That's what we asked residents in San Diego's District 9, which has the only competitive city council seat in this election. KPBS City Heights reporter Taryn Minto toured the district's diverse neighborhoods to see which candidate's message is resonating where. Just before 8 on a recent weekday morning in the historic neighborhood of Talmadge, neighbors walk their dogs or rest in the community park. From the tranquil scene, you wouldn't know just blocks away, an ugly traffic situation is playing out. Longtime resident Kelly Wagoner says heavy congestion has plagued the community for years. Having 22,000 cars a day come through um, is, real, is a real burden to the streets and the infrastructure. Wagoner hopes the incoming representative for San Diego City Council's District 9 will finally address the problem. Candidates Ricardo Flores and Georgette Gomez are running for the seat. Flores is chief of staff to current Councilwoman Marty Emerald. Gomez is an executive at the nonprofit Environmental Health Coalition. The two have been in a tight battle to represent the diverse district, which includes Kensington Talmadge in the north, where Flores resides, the college area in the east, City Heights in the south, where Gomez lives, and southeastern below that. The demographics shift greatly between each region, and this diversity presents Flores and Gomez with a range of community issues to address. 
in the Kensington Talmadge area, Sandag data shows the community of more than 14,000 residents is mostly comprised of single-family homes. The household median income is nearly $58,000. Wagoner, who sits on the Talmadge Maintenance Assessment District, says her vote is for Flores. We're hoping that he'll have the, the spirit and the determination to back our community on this issue. Just east is the college area, where the household median income is more than $42,000. The community is home to nearly 24,000 residents, including San Diego State University students. Resident Jose Reynoso says the mix of students and families has created a big issue in the neighborhood. The most important one would be the mini-dorm issue. Mini-dorms are homes that have been renovated to include more bedrooms, usually to house more students. It's grown to be such a problem. At a recent committee meeting, Emerald introduced a measure to tighten housing rules. It did have some opposition, but the committee moved it to the full council. It's unclear if a vote will happen before the election, but Reynoso, who sits on the area's community council and planning board, hopes the next District 9 council member will be on his side. Now, obviously, Ricardo has been able to be a little bit more supportive because it's his boss, Marty Emerald, who is spearheading the legislation that's currently before the city council or being reviewed by the city council. Moving down the I-15, you reach City Heights. The population jumps to nearly 78,000 residents, and the median income is just more than $33,000. That's where City Heights Business Association member Juan Pablo Sanchez runs the restaurant Super Cocina. He's not a resident of the district, but his Mexican eatery has served the community for more than a decade, and many of his employees live in the area. Sanchez says he's heard many concerns about one top issue. One of our biggest problems in City Heights is the lack of affordable housing. Both candidates list affordable housing as a priority. Sanchez says that's one of the many areas where they overlap, including their support of City Heights businesses. But one difference, he says, is where they draw their experience from. So I think one comes from being in office and seeing how everything's working, and one comes from, like I said again, like uh, more of the grassroots, talking to the community and seeing what's, what, what can be done to improve our business district. Further down the 15, you reach the edge of the district in southeastern San Diego. The community is divided among three council districts, but overall is home to 61,000 residents and has a median income of more than $31,000. Resident Karina Johnson says it's one of the few places in the city that's still affordable. At the same time, she's worried that affordability could draw new development to the neighborhood that might not serve residents' best interest. Things are changing really rapidly. And if the community is not involved in that change, um, you know, they might not get something that's good for them at the end of the day. Johnson, who is a member of the Southeastern San Diego Planning Group, says residents need a council member who will speak up for them. And she thinks Gomez is best for the job. So I think that Georgette has a long history of like fighting for the needs of those people. She's really social justice oriented. Johnson's stance shows a split between the District 9's north and south neighborhoods. A Voice of San Diego review of campaign contributions shows a similar trend. Gomez gets most of her support from City Heights, while Flores' big supporters are in the northern neighborhoods. That area also has the highest voter turnout in the district. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. The candidates for vice president meet in debate tonight, one week after the historic matchup pitting Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump. The showdown between Mike Pence and Tim Kaine may be critical in the race for the White House. The stakes are high. Democrats hope Kaine will build on Clinton's performance with a strong showing of his own. Mike Pence is feeling pressure from the GOP to deliver a steady, policy-heavy debate. You can watch the debate tonight right here on KPBS. Special coverage starts at 6 o'clock. In the race for the Senate, State Attorney General Kamala Harris and Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez face off tomorrow night at Cal State LA. This will be their only debate ahead of the election day. We'll have coverage on KPBS.org starting at 6 o'clock. Today, Los Angeles police released the video of the moments before a deadly police shooting. Saturday's killing of an 18-year-old has sparked widespread protests. Police say surveillance video shows Carnell Snell Jr. running with a gun in his hand. Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck said he released the video because the dueling narrative was causing a divide in the community. People in Los Angeles are also protesting the fatal police shooting of another man on Sunday. In that case, police say the man pointed a replica gun.
Governor Jerry Brown has signed a bill giving social workers a new way to report concerns about foster children. Social workers will now be able to anonymously, anonymously report welfare agency practices that endanger kids. The measure requires the Department of Social Services to develop the new system by January 1st. This comes on the heels of a new report that finds California foster kids are struggling to achieve. For the first time, education officials have released the standardized test scores for 70,000 kids in foster care. Numbers show on state-issued standardized tests, about 4% of students in foster care exceeded standards in language arts. That's compared to about 16% of non-foster students. And in math, about 3% of foster students exceeded standards compared to 14% of their non-foster classmates. A new study by researchers at Yale found that pre-K teachers, white and black alike, spend more time watching black boys expecting trouble. NPR's Corey Turner reports. There's a new study out of the Yale Child Study Center that I had to read a few times just to believe what it was telling me. The researchers recruited about 135 preschool teachers. They had them watch video footage of four kids playing, a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. And they told the teachers, their subjects, watch the video, there may be some challenging behaviors. As soon as you see something that could become challenging, hit the enter key on your keypad. Well, here's the trick. There was no challenging behavior. The researchers were using eye scan technology to see which child the teachers were looking at the most. And what they found is that the teachers, both white and black alike, spent the most time watching the black boy, waiting for bad behavior that never came. There's one more really interesting headline in this study, which comes later. The teachers were also given a one paragraph description to read of a hypothetical child with a stereotypical name who behaves pretty badly in class, pushes, scratches, throws toys. And some of the teachers were also given some biographical information that helped make sense of that behavior. They were told that the child lives with his mother, a uh, father has been in and out for years, they're relatively poor, the mother is depressed, works three jobs. The researchers wanted to know if knowing this information made the teachers more empathetic to the kid. Well, here's the shock. It, it did, but only if the teacher and the child were of the same race. If the teacher and the child, a white teacher and a black child, or even a black teacher and a white child, knowing that biographical information those teachers were less empathetic towards those students. And here's why this matters. Imagine, if this is true, if there's this empathy deficit in preschool, well, imagine where else that's true. A second case of mumps has been reported in San Diego this week. Health officials say a person at San Diego Christian College in East County was diagnosed with the highly contagious viral disease. That person may have exposed others last month. Authorities have not found a connection between that person and a sick student reported last week at Cal State San Marcos. Health officials encourage everyone to get vaccinated to prevent getting sick with the virus. San Diego residents can expect lower temperatures before it heats back up later this week. Regina Miller has that in tonight's forecast. Well, things are pretty quiet for Southern California. Actually, things quiet most of the state, even into Nevada, not seeing much at all going on. And during the nighttime hours in the metro areas, temperature of 64 degrees will have partly cloudy skies. In San Diego County, we'll see an overnight low of 57 degrees in Oceanside. Into Long Beach, we'll be at 60 degrees. San Diego at 64. Into uh, Poway, we'll be at 57 degrees. Borrego Springs. Springs. Your temperature is going to fall to 54 degrees and we have just a few patchy clouds, especially uh, developing late there along the coastal areas. For your Wednesday, we have just a cooler air mass kind of coming in, but we do see a good deal of sunshine in the forecast. And then as we go into the late week, we'll start to see it warming back up again here, especially across central and southern California. So your five day outlook along the coast, it'll be a little cooler for your Wednesday, 74 degrees. We have a partly cloudy sky. Thursday, we warm back up to 80 degrees, plenty of sunshine. Friday, we have plenty of sunshine as well at 87 degrees. And then for Saturday and Sunday, mostly sunny and the temperatures start to drop back a little bit and we're back to 81 by Sunday. Inland 
Maryland, we'll see a high temperature of 80 degrees and partly cloudy for your Wednesday. Overnight lows dropping into the low 50s. Plenty of sunshine for Thursday. Becomes rather windy on Friday and look at the temperature. It jumps to 93 degrees on Saturday. Sunny and very warm. Temperature of 92 degrees and 89 degrees by Sunday. As we take a look at the mountain forecast, we have sunny skies going to be pleasant for your Wednesday. Look at that temperature, 68 degrees. That's very comfortable. And then sunny and nice for Thursday as well at 70 degrees. Overnight lows Wednesday night. That's going to be a rather cool night, 38 degrees. Then we'll be at 43 for Thursday night. Sunny and windy. The winds pick up here as well on Friday with a temperature of 74 degrees. And then we get to 76 degrees by your Saturday. The desert outlook will have a high temperature of 90 degrees for Wednesday. Overnight low dropping to 57. And we have plenty of sunshine for Thursday, Friday. It starts to warm up uh, into the low 90s and we'll be almost in the mid 90s as we get to the weekend. 93 for Saturday and then we're going to be at 94 degrees for Sunday. Overnight lows dropping into the mid 50s for your Thursday. Friday. We'll get into the upper 50s as we get into your Saturday and Sunday. So looking pretty good here as well. I'm Regina Miller, KPBS News. In August, a man walked into his family's kitchen in the Pakistani city of Lahore and shot his sister in the head, killing her. So-called honor killings of women are on the rise in Pakistan. Associated Press reporter Luke Sheridan has the story. For months, workers at this steel mill in a dirt-poor Pakistani village taunted Mubin Raju about his sister Tazlim. They said she defied Islam, dating a man who had converted from Christianity. Your sister had an affair with a Christian. It would be better to kill your sister. As the taunts continued, Raju tried to reason with his sister. I told my sister it doesn't look good. People will disrespect me and our parents. His co workers said Raju considered killing himself. But when Tazlim married the Christian, Raju put the family's honor above the life of his sister. He killed her with a bullet to the head as she sat with her mother inside their home. Raju now faces life in prison, yet any hints of remorse are brief. It was as if a devil was in my head, such a thing that could not be forgiven. I was left with no option. As modernity pushes against tradition, Pakistan has seen an increase in the number of women and girls killed in the name of honor. Last year, 1,184 people died yet only 88 of them were men. In 2013, less than 900 people were killed. Many in the neighborhood are supportive of Raju. I am proud of this man. He has done the right thing. When news spreads, they will praise this man. Raju's father filed a complaint with police, but in Pakistan, Parents often do so to lay the legal groundwork so they can forgive the killer, a legal loophole that activists are fighting. There is no honor in killing. It is simply premeditated murder and must be treated as such. Even Pakistan's hardline Islamic Ideology Council, which is hardly known for speaking out to protect women, says the practice defies Islamic tenets. But it doesn't matter. In slums and far-off villages, people here live in a world where religion is inextricably tied to culture and tradition. Luke Sheridan, The Associated Press. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour special live coverage of the vice presidential debate. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. California officials have inducted San Diego's Mr. Padre to the state's Hall of Fame. Tony Gwynn spent 20 years with the Padres. He also coached at San Diego State University. Gwynn died in 2004 from salivary gland cancer. Other inductees include actors Harrison Ford and George Takei. 
An international food market is opening tomorrow on the border of City Heights and Talmadge. A handful of vendors are signed up. They'll be serving up lunch and dinner every Wednesday through December at the intersection of Alcohol Boulevard and 44th Street. There'll be a number of stands you'll recognize from other markets, including Papusa Express and Mama Llama Kebabs. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. Next month, California voters will have to decide on two death penalty measures. We'll have a look at Proposition 66, which would speed up the appeals process. And on Midday Edition, do debates make a difference in how people vote? That's at noon on the KPBS radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.